Welcome to this webinar. My name is Miriam Wagner. I am the executive director of the Wolf Institute, and I'm also the editor of uh, uh, Al Masak, which is the journal of the Society for the Medieval Mediterranean. Um, when you become a member of the society, the journal can, comes as part of your subscription. So I invite you to become a member and receive this wonderful journal to your home address. Um, this webinar comes out of a collaboration between the Wolf Institute and the Society for the Medieval Mediterranean. Uh, I think it's the eighth webinar we have in this series. We've been organizing them now for a whole year, uh, ever since the pandemic started. And we also have a few other partners now on board. We have the CSIC IMF, the University of Liège, and the Medieval Studies Research Group at the University of Lincoln. And uh, this week, this webinar is also part of a special festival that we have here at the Wolf Institute, which marks the transition of leadership at the Institute. After 23 years at the helm, uh, our founder director, Dr. Ed Kessler, is now moving to a non-executive role as founder president of the Wolf Institute. Uh, from the end of June, I will be taking over as the, as the sort of sole full, full director uh, of the Institute. So do watch this space and also please have a look at the rest of the program for the festival. For example, I'm shamelessly plugging my own events now. We have a webinar tomorrow on religious uh, rights and freedom of speech. And on Friday, we have uh, an ex exhibition opening, a virtual exhibition opening uh, uh, about artwork from the Cairo Geniza. So quite a few of you have been at these webinars when I look at the names, um, but for those of you who haven't, um, the Wolf Institute uh, is a research institution in Cambridge. Uh, we focus on religion and society, and we combine our research with teaching, with public education, and with policy work. And now I'll swap my hats. Uh, I'll put on the hat as the vice president of the Society for the Mediterranean. The Society uh, for the Medi Medieval Mediterranean was founded in 1997. Uh, it's dedicated to all aspects of the academic uh, study of, the Medi of Mediterranean history, and culture from the 5th to the 15th century. Um, and we foster cross-cultural and interdisciplinary and encourage debate on cross-pollination within the medieval Mediterranean. So it's a quick introduction now of how this webinar works. We normally have a Zoom webinar audience and we are live streaming via Facebook, but there seems to be a slight problem with the live streaming this time. So perhaps uh, if you re want to rewatch this, you don't have to, you can't go to Facebook, but we should go to the Wolf Institute YouTube channel where you should be able to watch this uh, video fairly soon um, after the, the seminar finish, the webinar finishes. So as for the structure, I'm going to introduce the chair, Dr. Antonella Diozzo Scorpo, who will in turn introduce the speaker of today, uh, Victoria Boguera Puiservea. We all learned how to pronounce that name because I made a, a fool of myself trying to do it last time. Uh, and uh, who will then present on her research for 15 minutes. And we also have a, a respondent, uh, Dr. Alessandro Rizzo. Uh, and then the three of them will have a short discussion among themselves while you can prepare questions to ask in the Q&A. Please type your questions in the Q&A portal at the bottom of your screen. Please don't put them in the chat because it's more confusing and more easy for the chair to manage the questions if they are in the Q&A portal. So this is time now to introduce the chair and I'm handing over to Dr. Antonella Luzzo Scorpo. Antonella, over to you. Hello, thank you, Miriam. Thank you, everyone who's in the virtual room today and uh, to our um, speakers. So we'll start with an introduction to Dr. Victoria uh, Burguera Puisever, um, who actually completed her PhD relatively recently, right, last year, um, in medieval um, cultures at the University of Barcelona with a dissertation on maritime dangers, piracy, captivity, and conflict management in the Crown of Aragon. So you can see uh, there's an echo of what she's going to talk about uh, today. Uh, Victoria is also a big a background uh, uh, degree in history um, from the University of the Balearic Island. And she also uh, uh, completed her MA in medieval cultures at the University of uh, Barcelona. And she's now a research collaborator in the Department of Historical Sciences and Art Theory at the University of the Balearic Island. You can't imagine how jealous just by thinking about the University of the Bionic Island right now that is raining. But anyway, um, she has recently received the uh, Medievalismo Award for uh, an article 
that she wrote on rescuing uh, Muslim captives in late medieval, uh, in the late medieval Mediterranean, thinking about the relationship between Mallorca and the Maghreb. And uh, she, uh, uh, and this is a prize that was granted uh, by the um, uh, Sociedad Española de Estudio Medievales. And Victoria, she has also been a visiting researcher at the University of Colorado at Boulder and at the um, University of Naples, Federico II. And she has disseminated her research nationally and internationally, um, and her publications include chapters uh, and articles, including actually the very recent enmity among friends at sea during the reign of uh, Ferdinand the um, First that was published in an edited volume uh, this year. So I'll uh, leave here uh, space for Victoria and I'll introduce later um, Alessandro, who's the respondent uh, after Victoria's presentation. Thank you so much, Antonella. <laughs> You are welcome to come when you want. I am now sharing the PowerPoint. Can you see it? Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for the introduction, Antonella. And thank you for this opportunity uh, to give this talk. It is a pleasure for me to have been invited to, to do this talk uh, in this webinar about the medieval Mediterranean. As the title suggests, I would like to talk about the political institutions of the Crown of Aragon, whose power allowed them to make certain decisions in case of maritime conflicts. It will, I will link the intervention not so much to the resolution of those conflicts as to their capacity to respond to them, according to the power acquired by each institution through the last centuries of the Middle Ages. The emerge of these institutions and the development of their competencies took place simultaneously with the political and economic expansion of the crown of the of the crown of Aragon in the Mediterranean. However, as a confederation of independent territories united under the rule of the King of Aragon, in the Crown of Aragon, these institutions didn't emerge concurrently in all kingdoms and did not always perform the same functions. However, it is possible to draw some common, some common patterns about their intervention. In my recently defended dissertation, I have studied the problem of piracy and the impact caused by unexpected and intolerable acts of aggression committed at sea. For the purposes of my research, I needed a very clear understanding of the different participants in the conflict. This was a challenging task as there were no previous studies about the involvement of the different institutions of the kingdom in maritime offensive and defensive issues. I considered that researching this matter would be fundamental for the purposes of my study and also very useful for anyone interested in maritime conflicts in the Western Mediterranean basin in the Middle Ages. During the 14th and 15th centuries, the expansionist policy of most Crown of Aragon's kings led to confrontation with the major talasocracies in the Mediterranean, and particularly with those whose markets and economic objectives coincided with the Crown's ones. From the beginning of the 14th century, the Republic of Genoa was the crown's major enemy and competitor for the hegemony over the Western Mediterranean area. Until the beginning of the 14th century, the kings of Aragon relied mainly on the nobility as a source of means for war. However, the permanent demands of the war at sea, including both conquest and defense, and the insufficient economic power of the monarchy prompt them to secure new sources of money and ships. In the crown of Aragon, the kings depended on the forces of the courts. They had to agree with them on some points in order to get financial means to implement their intentions. In exchange for that, the kings gave them privileges, autonomy and freedom of action. In order to decrease its dependency on the nobility, 
At the end of the 13th century, the monarchy started relying on the increasing power of the major cities of its domains, which were supported by a still incipient but promis promising commercial sector. Consequently, since the beginning of the 14th century, the wealthier maritime cities of the crown became the main promoters of the Mediterranean campaigns undertaken by the kings. The cities of Barcelona, Valencia, and Mallorca obtained a fleet of their own, which they could use for their own affairs, or alternatively, they could lend it to the king for his campaigns. The fleet was necessary for transporting food supplies, mostly grain, for trading, which was their most important economic activity, and last but not least, for the purposes of defense. As fleet owners, they could just lend the vessels or they could also finance the whole expeditions. Indirectly, the most important cities of the crown became responsible of the defense of the coasts of the kingdom. Since these cities acted as capitals of their own territories, the Principality of Catalonia, the Kingdom of Valencia, and the Kingdom of Mallorca, from the beginning of the 14th century, they were practically in charge of the coast patrol, despite the king's obligation to contribute to the defense of his territories. The coastal towns and cities financed the people who watched the coast from the strategic points of, on the land, and in some cases, they also financed the small fleets to fight off corsairs and expeditions against their territories. The intervention of the monarchy in these issues became increasingly anecdotal during the last centuries of the Middle Ages. The kings were more focused on their expansionist objectives in different parts of the Western Mediterranean basin, so the cities used their fleet individually or in a coalition to fight corsairs and pirates attacking the coasts. The monarchy compensated the economic support provided by the cities by granting privileges and autonomy concessions. For example, the fleets of Barcelona, Valencia, and Mallorca didn't have to submit to the admiral's orders and actors acted autonomously. In many cases, the political power and the scope of action of the most important cities of the crown of Aragon have to be situated between the great autonomy of the city-states of the Italian peninsula and the absolute submission of the cities to the monarchy. The major maritime cities had enough freedom to make decisions and act in their own interests at sea but under the supervision and with the approval of the king. This dual function of the cities, on the one hand, providing the means of war to the king, and on the other hand, being in charge of the coastal protection, was complemented by the emerge of two new institutions at the end of the 14th century. The first one, la Diputación del General, it was a permanent deputation of the forces of the kingdom included in the court. The three arms or states of the realm, the military state, which included representatives from the nobility, the ecclesiastical state with representatives from the religious hierarchy, and the royal state with representatives from the municipalities and the villages. It was called the deputation of the general because they collected a general tax that had to be paid by everyone on the territory of the crown. The deputation emerged as a consequence of the war against the neighboring state of Castile. The fact that it was a land neighbor motivated the three arms of the court to take part into the conflict in order to defend the territories. The military and ecclesiastical sectors, however, were not on most occasions interested in participating in maritime campaigns of expansion promoted by the monarchy, considering these actions as personal affairs of the king. 
For this reason, the royal estate, represented by the cities under royal rule, financed the major part of these expeditions together with the monarchy. The danger of an invasion by Castile motivated the intervention of the three forces represented in the court, as well as the emerge of a permanent de deputation representing them over the years. This being the case, the king did not anymore have to call and gather them systematically in connection with matters of war. Most of the crown's domain's borders, which needed protection, were maritime. So as the Diputación General was born to the defense of the territory, it very soon built a non-fleet financed by the three states of the realm. Over time, the Diputación became a permanent institution with jurisdiction to own a fleet, to lend it, as well as to arm and finance it. During the 15th century, the Diputació of Catalonia was the main provider of galleys for both individuals who wanted them for commercial expeditions and the monarchy, which used them for war. Therefore, its main role was that of, the, of an owner and lender of ships. In most cases, the king and the merchants acted as ship operators of the galleys of the Diputació. They armed, outfitted, and operated them, and also financed the commercial and military expeditions. The Diputació only financed the whole expeditions in cases in which the territory of the kingdom was endangered. It has to be said that this was mostly the case of the Diputació of Catalonia. The Kingdom of Mallorca collaborated with it only at the beginning. And it seems that the Diputació of the Kingdom of Valencia didn't play a leading role as that of Catalonia in providing vessels for war and commerce. From the beginning of the 15th century, the corporation of merchants played a new role in the maritime scenario of the crown of Aragon. The Catalan merchants who traded with the ports in the Eastern Mediterranean suffered continuously from the actions of the Catalans who lived in the small territories owned by the king in the island of Sardinia, specifically the cities of Cagliari and Alghero. The monarchy was no longer capable of maintaining its domains in that island. So during the second half of the 14th century, they reduced in size losing territory to the autochthonous governments, such as the Judicate of Arborea and other zones, which were under the influence of the crown's competitors, mostly Genoa. The Catalans who stayed there and the troops that guaranteed the maintenance of those enclaves surrounded by enemy territories had to resort to the practice of piracy to survive. Their victims could be enemies of the king, as well as his allies, and even his subjects. In which case, they went to Barcelona looking for the compensation for the damages suffered. Around the turn of the century, the king resorted to a compromise with the merchants under his rule to resolve the problem of the crown's possessions in Sardinia. While the king wanted to preserve his domains in the island, the merchants wanted the people living there not to disturb their commercial travels. So the monarch accepted to recognize the presence of two representatives of the merchants in the most important cities, maritime cities of the crown and to provide them with access to a tax implemented on commerce. This economic source had to be used for the defense of trade. In this case, the money was spent on maintaining the Sardinian territories in order to eliminate the problems they caused to the merchants. These measures, accorded by a parliament which in 1400 gathered together King Martin I and the most important maritime cities of the crown, were meant to last only three years. However, as was the case with the Diputación del General, in some cities they remained permanent and became the foundation of a corporation of merchants. In Barcelona, the defenders of trade, those in charge of collecting the fees on trade, clustered around the consulate of the sea, 
the court in charge of maritime cases. In Mallorca, the Corporation of Merchants was assembled in the Trade College, El Colegio de la Mercaderia, which was also very close to the Consulate of the Sea and the municipal governments. During the 15th century, the Corporation of Merchants was one of the main contributors to the coastal defense, as the merchants were interested in protecting their economic activity. They collaborated with the municipal authorities by financing the defensive expeditions carried out by the city's fleet, or sometimes accomplished by the chartered galleys of the deputation, since the, the corporation of merchants didn't have their own fleet. The royal fleet still played a major role in maritime affairs and was the only one commanded by the admiral. In the 15th century, it comprised the king's own vessels, the fleet of the cities which were taking part in a conflict, often acting as autonomous participants, and on occasions, the ships provided by the Diputación, as well as by private individuals. These individuals were noblemen, obliged to intervene in war according to feudal agreements, or volunteers who wanted to add the king hoping to get some benefits in return. Similar to the institutions, individuals could just provide vessels or in addition, provide financing as well. They could also be paid and earn a salary for acting as corsairs under the orders of the admiral. The royal fleet, however, was only organized and put into operation in cases of open war conquest campaigns and official travels of the members of the royal family. At the end, I would like to summarize the talk. As far as the crown of Aragon is concerned, we cannot st strictly differentiate between royal and private fleets, as was the case with other maritime political powers because the Crown's fleet could incorporate vessels and accept contributions from other institutions. We have to talk about different institutional interventions depending on the scope of the maritime campaigns. In case of undertaking a study regarding the attitude of the Crown before maritime conflicts, it is important to be aware of this composite structure of the political powers with different levels of intervention in maritime affairs. If we want to explore strategies of defense, we have to focus on the city's governments and their collaboration with the corporation of merchants and consider that their position might not always match the king's political intention. On the other hand, if we want to investigate the role of the royal fleet and the offensive campaigns, we also have to take into consideration the different agents that collaborated in them and how they could control the means of war to the detriment of the king. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any comments or questions, I, I would be very glad to answer them. Thank you, Victoria, for your very clear um presentation and super on time so thank you for that um before introducing our respondent i should mention i should have done it at, at the beginning so sorry about that uh that needless to say that i'm not professor Roser salikru who was supposed to be here today you might have seen in the original message and uh that circulated but unfortunately for reasons beyond um her control she couldn't be here with us today um so uh, that that's something to be to be said. So the respondent now uh, for this session is Dr. Alessandro Rizzo, whom you might know already if you have been here at the previous webinars. He was actually uh, delivering the previous um, session. Alessandro is an expert in uh, Mamluk um, history, in particular looking uh, at diplomacy in the later medieval period, and is currently based as a researcher um, at the university of Liège, being also one of the organizers um, of this uh, research seminar um, series. So, Alessandro. Thank you, Antonella. Hello to everyone. And thank you very much, uh, Victoria, for uh, 
for these presentations and for uh, having offered us this uh, overview uh, on the different institutions that uh, um, in the composite context of the, the Crown uh, of Aragon uh, were involved in the organization and the management of the fleet and, uh, and maritime conflict in the later Middle Ages. Uh, for me, and I think not only for me, it was particularly interesting among other aspects because you, you have uh, shed light on how these different social, uh, political, but also commercial actors uh, um, in some way were interconnected and could collaborate. But uh, on the other hand, uh, you have also highlighted how uh, these actors uh, um, play different roles. Uh, and if I can say that, they uh, cover a different field, uh, fields of competence. Um, so I, I have understood that, for example, the, the coastal cities uh, and uh, or since then the, the 15th centuries, also the uh, the corporations of uh, of merchants uh, were uh, responsible for the defensive uh, maritime war, while, for example, the royal fleet were or was organized and mobilized for. Uh, um, offensive attacks for campaigns uh, of conquest, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so, in, in this uh, in this respect, uh, I have the I have two questions for you. Several questions, but I, I'll ask okay. you only two questions, <laughs> and then I'll let the space uh, to, to the others um, to ask question, and I'll read the the, the question uh, to you. So, the, the first question is. Uh, um, you you have presented you have made this this distinction clear distinction between uh, offensive defensive uh, um, war and uh, and offensive expeditions, but was it this uh, these distinctions always so clear so so mm -hmm. sharp, or uh, you? You have also cases in which this distinction is not so so clear. So I think, for example, to an expedition that can uh, start as uh, defensive and then uh, evolve in an offensive uh, attack, or maybe um, expedition that had a double objective: so defensive and uh, and offensive. And in this case, uh, how uh, the the institutions collaborated, the, the different institutions that you presented. And but you, if you want to announce okay. then I'll, I'll ask you. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much for your for your question. It is very very interesting, and it allows me to talk more about that. Uh, so any campaign and any fleet were prepared for a purpose, for an objective, and mostly because were prepared by uh, an institution, so by the king, by the cities. So uh, they had an objective, but once underway, they could change uh, the, 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 the purpose of, of, of the fleet or this campaign, depending on the, the interests uh, of that moment. Uh, for example, the fleets that prepared and were armed and outfitted by the cities um, were uh, always in charge of uh, the, the coastal defense. And they were uh, armed and prepared um, in front of uh, a danger, in front of, um, of a fleet that uh, wanted to attack the territory. But um, as um, they were very expensive, in these cases, the cities um, tried to um, make this fleet uh, go down the, the, the northern coast of Africa to take some captives and uh, to, to um, help the, the, to, to pay the expeditions by uh, sending these, these, these captives as, uh, as slaves. So the, the purpose, the main purpose of this expedition was uh, 
the defense of the territory. But once underway, the fleet or the the strategy, the campaign could change. And uh, from another point of view, any uh, def defense or offensive, defensive or offensive campaign could be um, both uh, offensive and defensive because uh, we're attacking and defending at the same time. But the purposes were, uh, were or protecting the, the territory, so def the def defensive, or uh, attacking for conquest, for example, so offensive in this. Um, there is a distinction, but they could change um, when they, they were prepared. Okay, thank you. And I have an, another short question for you um, that concerns more uh, fiscal issues. So <laughs> uh, historians have, um, studied and demonstrated how um, the representative institutions of the crown of Aragon, um, for example, uh, the, the courts, the cortes, uh, or uh, mm -hmm. later the Diputación del General, how the, the prerogatives of these uh, institutions uh, and assemblies evolved and also expanded. And they have also studied the importance uh, of two, two aspects for this connected with these uh, institutions, the uh, warfare and the organization of war and, and taxation. And you have mentioned um, the Diputación del General mm. and the, the taxation, uh, the taxes uh, that were uh, levied for uh, the fleet. Uh, I would like to, to know a little bit more about how this system worked and uh, who had to pay these taxes useful uh, for the, the expenses uh, for the, the organization and the management of the fleet uh, and the conflicts. Thank you. Th thank you, Alessandro. So the deputation of the general was created in a war context and um, as I said, uh, it was uh, a, um, a, depu a permanent deputation of the three uh, arms or three states of the realm. So uh, we only can find Diputación in the territories which had um, courts. So in Catalonia, in Valencia and uh, Aragon, not in Mallorca. <laughs> but um, it's called of the general because um, they were in charge of um, collecting a general tax, a general tax implemented in the whole territory of this uh, de deputation, so Catalonia, Aragon, or Valencia, and it was also general because uh, it has to be it had to be paid uh, by everyone. There were not privileged people um, who who had not to pay. Uh, and was implemented, uh, this uh, general tax, uh, one in um, the um, production and the sale of clothes, and another one in the um, as, uh, export and import of uh, merchandise. There were uh, these uh, two taxes that then um, became permanent and uh, um, among other purposes were dedicated to the defense uh, of the territory and also to um, maintain and uh, to build uh, a fleet when uh, it, um, it was necessary. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Professor David Abulafia, who asks, what were the effects on uh, what you describe of the economic and social crisis in Barcelona in the late 14th and 15th centuries and the increasing prominence of Valencia? Yeah, what, were, what was the effect? What, this is a very difficult uh, question. Oh, what we can see uh, and what I, I very highlight in my dissertation is that this um, distribution of forces that uh, I have seen 
at the beginning of the 15th century, uh, it changed uh, at, at the end of the, of the 15th century uh, because um, after Alfonso the Magnanimous, uh, then the John II uh, um, used to, um, to gather power around him and to um, decrease the power of the other forces of the, of the, of the kingdoms. Uh, so we can't compare the power of the cities at the beginning of the 15th century or at the end of, of that century. Uh, it is the, of the process of the, of, the, of, of the creation, I don't know if it's the word to, to say that, of the, the authorityism of, of, the, of the monarchy. Uh, and how it uh, changes uh, with, uh, after the, the civil war. Um, my dissertation has finished in uh, uh, 1458. So I haven't studied the civil war and it is then when Valencia took advantage on uh, Barcelona. But what I can see in my studies is that uh, Barcelona and Valencia uh, had uh, a lot of power but, uh, in, in that moment um, it, um, because most of the problems of maritime, of maritime problems were um, caused by the, the individuals um, in, in the, that uh, were part of the royal army. So uh, the cities were uh, in front of the of the king uh, on protecting the, the, the territory the th the king were uh, doing his war in the in the Italian peninsula so the Iberian territories were in that moment very um, uh, without without the defenses because their fleet was only engaged on the wars uh, of the of the king so uh, the cities, took advantage of this situation and um, had uh, an increasing power of decision and also had to um, rely on individuals, so on corsairs, on forces um, uh, of individuals to, um, to maintain the defense of the, of the Iberian kingdoms. I don't know if I have responded it, but um it is thank, thank you victoria this is very difficult <laughs> there are, and there mostly are in questions. english <laughs> yeah no it's 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 fine plus i mean we have a limited amount of time and try to cover all the questions that are coming in mm. also through the chat so we have one about um whether you can tell something about who and how the arsenals, the atarazanas of Barcelona yeah. and Valencia were maintained. Were maintained. Okay, the arsenal of Barcelona were uh, of the king. So it was not of the cities. The, uh, but the king uh, let, let them to um, construct and maintain the city's fleet and the Diputacio's fleet. So the, the city of Barcelona, the Diputació of Catalonia, and the king used the, the royal arsenal of Barcelona. Um, the, the royal arsenal was the most important, but not, was not the only one, as uh, in, in Valencia or in Mallorca. Um, and I am not very sure about the functioning of the arsenal of Valencia, but I think that it couldn't be very different from um, that of Barcelona. Thank you, Victoria. There's another question in the chat and then I'll pass it on to Alessandro because there are also more questions in the Q&A. <laughs> just, just okay. to combine. Um, okay. There's a question about, um, Oops, sorry, my, can you still hear me? 
Yeah. Yes. Yes. Sorry, my internet just went. Um, uh, someone is asking whether you think there is a connection with the cultural impact of this fleet on the manifestation in Christian and uh, Muslim festivals from the Middle Ages onwards in the Mediterranean territory, especially in the Catalan uh, area and in uh, Italy, unless uh, you think instead that this is something uh, completely unrelated and uh, has more to do instead with an outlet for this Reconquista um, activities. Well, uh, it has to be said that these campaigns uh, were created only, I wrote down open war, but uh, if we talk about open war and mostly in the crown of Aragon in the 14th and 15th century, so in the last centuries of the Middle Ages, we talk about uh, the, the, the war with or against the Christian powers. Uh, what um, we can see in the, in, the, in the Mediterranean and in the crown of Aragon is that the war against the Muslims was not uh, as the war for the Reconquista on the lands of the Iberian Peninsula. Um, there, there, there were not big campaigns uh, against Muslims. The Mus Muslims and mostly the North of Africa was only uh, a permanent market to, to take breads. Uh, so the corsairs that um, used the, the, the corsaying of the piracy to, to took captives uh, could also do it as an economic activity uh, like commerce, but um, kings, the, the, the kings, the cities, the diputacion, the merchants never uh, have been involved in these in this, um, activities and these com campaigns. Uh, we talk about the, the, the political and economic enemies of the kings of Aragon. And there were uh, in, this mo in that moment in the Mediterranean that were uh, only Christians. Uh, yes, the, the, there, wa there was uh, Guerra de Corso, cor Corsairing war, uh, Christians and Muslims, but there was not uh, um, uh, a preoccupation. They, the, the, um, the authorities were not worried about that because um, there, there was not a danger of uh, the... The, 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 ter the territory of the econ or the economic um, activities of the kingdom. Thank you. I read to you another question about how effective was the use of crusading indulgence, the, the crusading indulgence in the raising of military forces in the coastal cities in the 15th century. Can you repeat the question, please? How, ef how effective was the, the use of uh, the crusading indulgence in, in the raising of uh, military forces uh, of, in the coastal oh. cities in the 15th century? Okay. But, but, well, they were, they were crusading indulgences in, um, in the, if we're talking about the crown of Aragon in the 12th century and the 13th century. But I began my investigation on, uh, but I, I have done my dissertation uh, on the first half of the 15th century. It is true that I have, um, um, I had to go back to, to the, the 13 and the 14 to understand the composition of everything. But uh, in, my, in my research, I have never seen the crusading indulgences. I have just studied it, I studied them in the, in the 13th and in the 12th and 13th century, if we are talking about the crown of Aragon. Okay, and I have a, a little question concerning sources. Uh, where uh, did you find the, the, the sources uh, of the Diputación del General or uh, 
concerning the, the actions of the, the corporations of merchants. Okay, so, the sources have been preserved, all of them, all of the different types of sources. Um, they have been preserved in the archive of the Crown of Aragon and only in the municipal archives uh, of the most important or not so important cities. Um, we are very lucky. <laughs> but I have to say that uh, I haven't seen and I haven't investigated all of the different, these different types of, of sources. I have uh, based my, my research uh, basically on municipal sources. Um, the, those sources um, have shown me though, that the intervention of different institutions uh, in, in the, in, in the management of conflicts and was because of that, that I was aware or I thought that it was very important or, or I needed to be very clear, to, to have very clear uh, the scope of action and the, in the, the, the jurisdiction of, of, of all of them because it, ha it uh, has happened to, to other authors that looking just uh, municipal sources have had the impression that uh, the position of the Crown of Aragon against the mar maritime conflicts uh, was uh, only defensive. And it was because the municipal sources show uh, mostly the de defensive systems, but um, in looking at uh, the intervention of the king or the Diputación General or, or, or other, other institutions, the point of view and the, the approach to a same problem change, changed, changes. Um, and the, the, the answer is yes, we have the sources, but I, I haven't studied all of them. And it, it would be... Um, enormous and uh, <laughs> impossible for a dissertation <laughs> and, and for a life, I, I think. <laughs> and another question concerned that you, you have spoken about uh, the, the 15th century, but uh, can you tell us something about how the, this system, the intervention in maritime conflicts uh, and organization of the fleet worked before uh, the 15th, 15th mm. century. Yeah, I, I have begun for the 14th century because it was at the beginning of, 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 of 1400 that the, the Crown of Aragon became a, or a, began the, the way to, to, to become a, um, a telesocracy. Uh, at the beginning, um, yes, before the 14th century, um, the Crown of Aragon uh, did uh, accomplish the conquest only for the Kingdom of Mallorca and the Kingdom of Valencia. So, uh, uh, did uh, still not um, begun, be begin to, to, to increase its power in the Mediterranean. So it was, uh, as I said, um, during this expansion that uh, the, mon the monarchy had to, um, to find new sources, to find new means uh, to, to accomplish the uh, objectives of expansion. So um, the monarch did not anymore uh, relied on nobility and then uh, um, began to rely on the cities and then on the Diputación and then on the merchants. And uh, at the, in the 15th century, we have uh, a very, um, a, a structure uh, that it is not only the differentiation between the state fleet or the state intervention and the individual inter intervention. Because in the Crown of Aragon, we have to uh, talk about more than that, more than the difference of a state or royal in this case and individuals. 
it's it's a bit more complicated. Okay, thank you. We have another question concerning the various treaties, uh, for example, with Tunis uh, or other powers that require that the Aragonese pursue uh, that the Aragonese pursue pirates uh, uh, who may have attacked the North African ships protected by by the treaty. And the, the question is, uh, would these fleets uh, have participated uh, in anti-piratical campaigns uh, as well as open warfare? Yes, um, it, uh, it were not the main purpose when they were created. Uh, for example, I am thinking about the campaigns in, um, uh, made by the Alfonso the Magnanimous. Um, they prepare, um, he prepared uh, two um, main fleets um, and the purpose, the main purpose of them were the conquest of the kingdom of Naples. But uh, in the meanwhile, uh, um, he dedicated uh, his fleet uh, um, to other purposes. And one of them were, uh, were, was the, the attack to Tunis. Uh, and uh, the conquest of, uh, of the island of Jerba, it, it has been uh, studied uh, by um, uh, Paul Junient uh, in a recently defended dissertation last year. Um, and uh, yes, I, I am sure that um, Alfonso de Mananimos was interested in attacking Tunis in that moment because Tunis was... Um, from the second half of the 14th century was the hegemonic uh, potence in the North Africa. So uh, the, um, almost all the, the vessels, corsairing vessels that arrived in the coast of, uh, the, coast of, uh, of the Crown of Aragon were, were from um, Tunis, Algier and Bugia but I don't know the pronunciation in, in English. Uh, but the main purpose of that campaign were not attacking Tunis. Then they attacked it and, and, and took advantage and uh, were interested also in doing that. But it was uh, not the main purpose of, uh, of the expedition in that case. I, I have put the example of that case because I remember it well. But um, it it can be um, it can be um, the same in other in other campaigns in the in those centuries. Mostly, I am talking about mostly the the first half from the of the fifteenth century because it is uh, the moment that I know the more. Thank you, You're Antonella. Welcome. Do we have other questions in the chat? So I cannot see any other questions in the chat. I've got a question for Victoria, quick one, and then I think we can wrap up at the hour for once on time. Um, so, <laughs> okay. Victoria, I was wondering, um, and this is a question as a non-expert, but because you said that obviously, originally at least, the... Uh, the motivation, well, any expedition started with a specific task, then that task could evolve once you were uh, into it. But I do wonder whether this also changed the makeup of who was on board. So in other words, does it change in terms of who was joining um, in, in terms of, I don't know, social belonging, their tasks within um, the, the daily management of the fleet or anything? Oh, uh, <laughs> I, sorry. I, <laughs> it is a very, uh, a very interesting question, but I don't know if I can um, answer it because I, I have never seen anything about it. I think it, it, it didn't change because uh, they were the same and they were doing um, so. When, when uh, people were accorded in 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 as as a crew of a, of a, of an expedition of a, a galley, uh, they the they contract um, obliged them to finish the campaign. It is a thing that I haven't studied, but I guess um, 
they were the same. But maybe I am not the the best person to answer that question. But it's very, very interesting. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> no, thank you, Victoria. I guess this also depends on the kind of evidence that you have in the records yeah. that you are looking at. So if this is not obviously part, part of that. So, so thank you anyway for uh, addressing that question. You, um, I cannot see any other questions in the chat. So unless there are any other questions? If not, if not, I would like to thank you once again profusely, Victoria, for joining us um, today and for her very, very interesting uh, paper, the result of many years of intense studies that culminated in her um, PhD uh, award last year for which congratulations. Um, thank you. And uh, also thank you to um, Alessandro Rizzo, who has been a fantastic respondent, as always. Um, and to Miriam, hosting this um, event. Actually, um, Miriam, would you like to uh, briefly announce what's the forthcoming uh, seminar next month? Yes, yes, heavily. So um, please do join us again for our next webinar in the series, which will take place on the 22nd of June with the title, Who Are You Calling a Pilgrim? Christian, Jewish and Muslim Travelers in the Eastern Mediterranean, 1100 to 1350, uh, with Harry Munt, um, Phil Booth and Marcy Friedman and chaired by Jessica Terni pierce So please do come along again to that one. Back to you, Alain Antonella. To wrap up. Fantastic. Thank you, Miriam. And at the next event, we will be also um, able to announce that we are going, considering the success of this series, we're going to go for series two. Um, hopefully, it's not going to be like any movie that you start with a great movie and then the, the second one is not that good. We want to continue um, with with this um so please stay tuned uh, follow us as always on uh, um, social media we will communicate also by email um to all our members don't forget the society and almastak just as a just as a reminder and thank you very much to all of you for joining us today